right. Thank you, Alex, for clapping your hands and bringing everyone to silence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was wonderful. So, thank you all for coming. This is a bigger group than I think we were anticipating. Totally. Hanna had the idea of a small, intimate circle in one of our classrooms where we could just chat. We didn't expect to walk in and find the room full of people, but I think it's great that everyone is as interested. And you get to hear me talk in my Missouri, Texas English accent, which people don't usually get to hear in us. So uh, Kathleen wants to make a few introductory words in Esperanto, and I'll translate for her. Mi parolos esperante, sed en la sekva parto eh, Hanna kaj Margaret parolos eble en la angla. So I'm going to speak in Esperanto, but afterwards Hanna and Margaret will probably speak in English. En vi povas viajn demandojn starigi en la angla au en Esperanto. And you're welcome to ask in English or Esperanto if you have questions. So, la ideo de tiu renkontiĝo venis en mian kapon Char mi imagis ke anko vi estos tiom entuziasmai kai scivolai pri la familio kai pri la personoj kia mi estis kia so, mi renkontis ili. The idea came to my mind because I thought you'd probably be equally enthusiastic as I am about the family of Dr. Zamenhof. Mi ŝatus unue demandi kiom da personoj legis la libron Zamenhof Strato. How many of you have read the book Zamenhof Street? Ha! Bonege! Bonege! Ni havos kelkain informoin. We're going to be able to tell you a few things tonight. Tamen, mi esperas ke vi opinias grava afero koni iom pli pri la creinto de Esperanto. So I hope you understand the gravity of understanding more about the man who created Esperanto. Sed ne attendu grandan promenadon en la genealogia arbo de la familio kun ciui detaloi. So we're not going to take a long walk through the family tree of Dr. Zamenhof with all the details. Por tio mi havos exerzon kiun vi povas preni. And of course, because I'm Kathleen Kovacs, I prepared work for you to do related to Hannah's presentation. That's a liberal translation. Ke vi sias mi nenion donas sen page por trovi la nomoin vi devas labori. Yes, and I don't give anything without making you pay something, so you're going to have to work some to figure out the names of everybody involved. Kai verŝajne anko vi mem ne scias ĉion pri via propra familio. And you also don't know everything about your own family. Io analizu vin mem. Ne kiel nomiĝis, kiam naskiĝis, do ne starigu tre, tre tiklajn demandojn. Yeah, don't, don't ask ticklish questions tonight. Think about your own family tree and how much you'd have to figure out to figure out who's who and who's related to who. Kion mi antovidas por tiu vespero estas du-parta konversacio. I imagine a two-part conversation tonight. Kaj la du virinoj ĉi tie Estas fratinoj, sed ilia rilato al Esperanto estas du diversaj aliroj. So these two ladies who are with us tonight both have a relationship with Esperanto, but it's quite different for each of them. Do, vi audos, char hana parolos pri siaj sentoj kaj konoj pri la movado kaj iom pri humoranismo en la ideologia. Hana is going to talk about her feelings and thoughts about the movement and homaranismo and the whole idea of Esperanto. <coughs> and Margaret is on the practical flanco. And Margaret is on the practical side of things. So she is as kiel mi ciam pensas unu el vi. So she's really one of us. Us. Yeah, us. <laughs> me. Me. Yes. Me. She decides iom post iom da premo au sento de devo lerni Esperanto. She decided after a sense of duty or pressure that she was going to learn Esperanto. Ke ŝi laboras pri tio kiel ni ĉiuj. Akuzativo ĉio estas granda. And she works on it just like all of us do, accusative at all. Ke ŝi laboras pri tio kiel ni ĉiuj. 
diris ke la Esperanto tute ne estas facila. And I'm glad that even Bertilo admitted that Esperanto isn't that easy. Kaj mi donas lecionojn al ŝi kadre de ekparolu Skype kaj ŝi ofte eksplodas. Kial faris tia ekzamen? So I, I, I'm given her lessons by a Skype using the Ekparolu program, and she sometimes just erupts. Why in the world did Zamenhof do it that way? Kaj mi diris, plendu hejme. And I say, you can complain at home. Do, mi povas paroli pri la spertoj kaj manieroj instrui, sed unue ni donu la vorton al Hanna pri la ideologia kaj familia parto, se vi konsentas. So we can talk about the experience and the learning process, but we're going to let Hanna talk first about the ideological side, if you're in agreement with taking that approach. Yes. Okay, well, and let me say one more thing. Hanna has a rather soft voice. So it's important for the group to stay quiet. And if you can't hear, just wave your hand and I'll say. I will, I will talk try. A little loud, talk I will a little try. louder or we'll, we'll, try, try, to, try, we'll try to repeat. But it's really important to be quiet in the room so that you can hear what she has to say. Well, good evening. Uh, I wasn't prepared to make any particular presentation I was hoping for exchange more more like but uh, um, let's put maybe Esperanto language in perspective of the life of Zamenhof um, he lived um, in Poland in uh, Białystok which was a crossroad really for cultures languages and um, religions. It was a merchant's uh, a town, so a lot of people were coming and going. And there were multi languages being used there. And to make it very simple, everything was lost in translation right there. And uh, he got this idea, of course, that one language would simplify things for people, uh, make it easier. Um, and it, it was a brilliant idea that was stolen somehow by English mm -hmm. in later on in, in the mid of 20th century. But at his time, it was just really um, fantastic uh, um, try, try out to, to, to bring uh, people right. together. Um, well, I, I think that, uh, so, Anna, yes. People are saying they can't hear. They can't hear. Does anyone, does a microphone disconnect? Can we use it? There's a microphone I will try better. <laughs> no, I will try better. No, 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 no. In no. room 315, there is apparently equipment. But it will take a while to yeah, get it. We don't have a while. Yeah, yeah maybe. Fun. Maybe I get steady. Yeah. 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 Uh, I have actually something there okay, that okay, maybe okay. I, I may so, look for. So, um, so Brian's going to try to see if he can get the mic to work at the podium. We might be able okay. to do that. So the belief. Zamenhof believed that there were three things that were really dividing humankind. Uh, politics, religion, and language. And uh, language was the first one, the, the, the easiest to maybe create so people would smooth other differences. Uh, and uh, it worked very well, uh, but English somehow stole the thunder, I think, right? Uh, in a sense that um, naturally, maybe because of, um, especially after the, the Second World War, that um, American English that 
influence the world and, and really spread very well. Um, but uh, the idea of Hamaranismo is as uh, important and, and uh, alive uh, right now, I think, should be as it was when, um, when he was uh, thinking about it. So um, do you, m maybe I ask you, is for you Esperanto somehow connected with the idea of Hamaranismo or you are doing it just simply for getting together? Yes, sir. Yes. Canadjo in English. Oh, and this is an English language. Oh. <laughs> um, yes, I agree. And uh, uh, for me, yes, this is Marano. I believe it's a belief that I am a member of humanity. Okay. So that you, the Homerano, the uh, citizen of the world, is, is just a. I wouldn't use citizen. Okay. Just a member of humanity. The member of humanity, then that. Okay. Okay. Uh, anybody else? That's yes. Okay. One of the terms that's oftentimes heard is, is the eternal idea of Esperanto. So there's this common thing of well, what's, what's this all about? Yes. And while everybody obviously might not share the same opinion, I do think that most of us would acknowledge that there's something about the nature of everybody being able to communicate together that goes along with the idea that everybody. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, I first heard of Esperanto in Berkeley in 1969, and there was a very famous book called The Whole Earth Catalog. Mm -hmm. And Stuart Brand, who was the editor, published a picture of the Earth from outer space. And that was a very iconic experience for people. Yeah. And so for me, that's the first time I heard of it. Um, and so that was a very revolutionary concept for me, and that was 50 years ago today. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that was a very attractive thing for me, a very idealistic thing for me, um, and that we could share our feelings in a language that everyone else could understand no matter if they were from Mongolia <laughs> or Albania. Yeah. Yeah. So. And may I, may yeah, I add yeah. something? Yes, just uh, you uh, started talking, uh, you started talking saying that for Zamenhof, uh, three things were dividing the world and people was language, politics, and religion. And, religion. and I think that we should not forget that language is an expression of what we are. Uh, uh, this morning we were talking with Istvan, uh, is he here? Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 um, about uh, the way that different languages and different sort of ways of expression can change what we want to say. N not really what we want to say, but may be understood differently. And I myself and Hanya also speak, and most of you, I think, speak several languages. And when I was uh, learning several languages, I uh, realized that when I was speaking French or English or Polish, I was not exactly the same person. And um, the important thing comparing to English, which I love, Esperanto doesn't represent a special culture, a special land, a special and a special political system or belief. Only the one that we are all human beings. So this is, that's why it's a very, it, it's a real, really common tool for everybody because everybody is equal <coughs> Uh, regarding the use of Esperanto. And so it is a tool, it is a language that is also a tool for peace because nothing is dividing us. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's, absolutely, that's absolutely correct. Absolutely. And there's no, it's, it's very difficult for the politics and religion to sip 
into Esperanto because there is, um, we don't go to church and pray in Esperanto, we don't, you know, go to political rallies and speak Esperanto, so, so it's like, stays very, um, We can, but Esperanto is not expressing you know, our yeah. beliefs regarding politics and yeah. religion. I also yes. just want to say, first of all, I want to know a comment, um, but um, especially as somebody who is maybe a little bit younger than some others and who grew up with the internet, um, a lot in our generation kind of grew up with kind of the idea of a global village mm. through the internet where we're all part of this broader group where it doesn't matter if you're American or Canadian or Mexican, we're all using Facebook the same way. Um, but one of the large boundaries is still language, being able to understand somebody else um, even for something as silly as just a little joke or pun. So I really connect with the idea of Esperanto as this beautiful tool where our global village maybe already has a couple walls, but this is a good way to go right on over them. So do you think, let me ask you, do you think that Esperanto has a future on internet for that purpose? Do you think that people may become excited about it, that it will? I hope so, okay. but, um, I'm not certain that it's probable, because I think one of the reasons why English became the next big language of diplomacy is that it had so much economic power. Exactly. Um, and I think that's something that, unfortunately, Esperanto doesn't have the means to acquire. Um, and without that economic power, it won't uh, acquire the leverage it needs to kind of pull more people in. It will always have a future, um, but I'm not sure it will have the final victory. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. Being from the United States, there are certain countries that you're not supposed to have contact with. Mm -hmm. uh, Cuba and Iran being two of those. Through Esperanto being at the UCO, I've been able to talk to people from those countries. Mm -hmm. So it, for me, it's been a way to uh, break down some walls or at least learn something about other people. Absolutely. And, and same with reading magazines like Contacto or Esperanto, you get viewpoints that are written in other countries that don't reflect the propaganda that we read in our own newspaper or hear from our president. <laughs> Absolutely, and I will make a comment to that, that uh, Esperanto was very popular behind the Iron Curtain for that reason, exactly, <laughs> and was uh, allowing people contact with other cultures and uh, political views. They, the congresses were, were so popular and people had sort of a ticket to go out for, yeah, for at least for the congress for some meetings and when congress was in, in Warsaw for example uh, in 1959 it was huge think because it was like a window to the world so exactly and Hannah recited a poem yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <She wasn't. laughs> yeah. yes I know I already spoke before but it's a very famous book of letters and in that book of letters there's correspondence between Albert Einstein and Sigmund Freud and in that correspondence, what they say is that the greatest evil of the 20th century is nationalism. And so my thinking is that now, of all times, particularly in the United States, but also in Europe and all over the world, you have that ascendancy of <coughs> nationalism and um, I think it's more relevant than ever that people reach for a language to talk to other people. Um, and I remember reading those letters between Freud and Einstein, you know, 30 years ago. And here we are. And so I think everything we're doing here is the right thing at the right time. Yeah, yeah, I will do that, yes, well said. 
Yes, sir. Um, I interestingly discovered Esperanto through researching politics. <laughs> and I had gone down a long road of trying to come up with perfect ideas about how the world should be political, looking at many different perspectives in economics or in you know, different political histories in different countries. And I wanted to imagine, you know, and I, I had good intention, <coughs> I wanted to imagine that I could discover what would be best for the world just sitting in my room reading books, uh, just sitting in my room alone, and never having to, you know, aside from certain things that I went and did, I like was a delegate in the U.S. political system, and you know would go to certain conversations and meet up with people in little clubs and stuff. Uh, but ultimately, when I discovered Esperanto, part of what was appealing in it to me was that it represented a shift from trying to imagine that I alone could come up with something that would be, you know, good for everybody else. And it made me much more interested in dialogue and in listening. Um, you know, you, you can't design a perfect world for everybody else without asking them what that would look like for them. Yes, that's right. And uh, Esperanto really came to represent like a, a step forward for me, where I wanted to be much more interested in not talking at people about ideas, even ideas that might be good, but I wanted to have conversations with people um, and become a better listener too. And let me ask you further, is it just the language or it's the idea of Romanal? It's certainly that, for me it's always been for me, it was driven more by ideas initially. Mm -hmm. um, and then I became very interested in it as a language. Um, and I've always liked that idea ever since I started getting into uh, politics over the last 10 years of that I wanted a world that was more, um, that was less interested in borders and nationalism. Um, and, and yeah, that's. I think that's very much implicit, at least, mm -hmm. uh, but it's something that I choose to embrace. Yes. Not the best. <laughs> no, it's great. I know I've already spoken, but I'm a very chatty individual, and I well know the language I'm speaking. Um, I just wanted to add on that one of the things that I find super beautiful about Omar and Ismo is um, this concept that, yes, we are part of this extended human community, um, but it doesn't demand that we become homogenous. I feel like in the Esperanto community, it's very well accepted that Esperanto doesn't need to be anyone's first language. It can be your second language, but you can still maintain your, your mother tongue, your culture where you came from, and you bring that to the table. Um, not to add it all to a melting pot where we all become the same, but to add it to a great buffet where there's so many wonderful things to enjoy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not only you're encouraged to, to keep your culture, your language, uh, your religion, your political views. You are just asked that you leave it maybe behind closed door when you come outside to meet other people because it's irrelevant for them. <coughs> so, uh, yes, sir. Um, yeah, so I was a, a humanist first. Uh, the church I go to is a secular humanist uh, church. And uh, the, like, the history of like ethnic culture was uh, a Jewish rabbi, broke from tradition, and started the humanism philosophy uh, that our, our church uses. And so when I was, I heard about Esperanto and I was reading about it, I was like, oh, this is our story all over again and was like drawn to it immediately. And it connected so well. Thank you. Well, and so is my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, so people who are humanists tend to learn Esperanto, but also works the other way around. Growing up with Esperanto is one of the things that contributed to making me a humanist. So I worked both ways. We are so glad that young people who are who were brought up in Esperanto is absolutely unbelievable for us. Yes. Uh, for me, I'm speaking for me, yeah. Yeah. absolutely <laughs> for us. Because we were not brought up as Esperantists. Unfortunately. Yes. If I still made from the same family, I'd like to be a bit of a 
of the, of, how you say in English, the uh, do you say the diet, the, the, uh, the advocate of the diet? Maverick, yes, advocate of the devil advocate. Yeah, precisely. Well, what we said was just Esperanto allows you to stay who you are, which is, by the way, the Luxembourgish national slogan, <laughs> let's stay who we are. But <laughs> <laughs> that's not necessarily a good thing. It can be a good thing. But once I met an Esperanto, we, we stay there for the night. He, he is German. I vaguely knew him from before. He's German. And I didn't know that in the meantime, he became a fervent German nationalist, oh, oh. while all the time being an Esperantist. Mm -hmm. And we had a, a half, half a night long discussion about this thing. <laughs> it was not easy. And in the end, what I discovered was that his idea of Esperanto being compatible with the nationalist idea is that, well, everybody stays in their own corner, and they keep their culture, they keep their language to themselves, and they don't mingle. So they're not mingled. That's a bad thing. So, oh, in, a, in a way, some ideas of Esperanto can even be dangerously compatible with yeah. nationalism, which is a strange thing. That so is a strange thing. Never maybe I asked it there. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, uh, coming here uh, has been very encouraging to me. I've been very discouraged with the hatred that's in our country right now, and not just for outsiders in the country, not the, just the nationalist movement, but hatred for each other within the country. And it's to me, it's refreshing to be around people who don't want to pay attention to the borders, but want to include everyone and appreciates people's differences and what they can bring. That, yeah, absolutely. This was the, the main idea uh, of Homeranismo to, to bring people together, and Esperanto was just a tool to, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm always referring to English as the language who, who, who just took over, but um, it's not the same thing. It would be, of course, better at it being Esperanto because language has, and English has that. Uh, baggage of political and mm -hmm. territorial and everything else. So it's, it's just sort of uh, pushed, maybe it's not the best word, but sort of a natural uh, consequence. But uh, it would be, of course, much better than, than mm -hmm. Esperanto. In our local club, we really don't leave our religion and politics at home at all. We actually encourage people to be who they are in our club. Okay. We talk about our differences. We talk about our religions. We learn from each other, and we do that in at a round table, a, a table of people, <coughs> and we learn not only to tolerate, but <coughs> listen to each other and respect each other. How about politics? We have had political differences in our club, and. I've learned myself, I've learned not just to try to push my idea or convince somebody. I really want to learn why somebody else has a different opinion than I do. Because they believe in their opinion. They're not a bad person. Why do they have a different opinion than I do? I want to find out why. And in Esperanto, probably it's easier than in English in some way because it's just well, it gives us it gives this you, atmosphere yes. yeah. of equality Come. and respect. Wonderful. That's, a, that's great. So Chuck, out of you, Chuck. I have observed that many people were attracted to Esperanto because of the language. But those that stick with it normally meet the community, become part of the community. And that's why 20 years later, they're still, still speaking Esperanto. Those that don't make it into the community often don't continue speaking Esperanto. The Esperanto community. Yes, the Esperanto. I'm just going to follow up on what Celia was saying a minute ago. Um, no, that seems to me when, when she talks about the, um, the fact that people come to Esperanto Kite. And everybody <laughs> brings their own contributions to contribute to something greater. It seems to me that that part of it was not part of the Zamenhof idea. Do we? <laughs> 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 Did he um, actually think in 
in terms of creating a culture with uh, contributions from different no, no. backgrounds? That's what we're No, no, say. did I say that? Yes. Or maybe I was... No, no, uh, was talking oh, about oh, the oh. fact that, that no, And I, I agree that, that we do that, but yes. I was just thinking that that project was not his it, idea. It wasn't his idea. he never got to that. But it was also a hundred years ago, it was yes. a harsher, different world. We, we evolved, we communicate probably. Um, so I, I'm going to uh, kind of expose my ignorance a bit here. I actually know almost nothing about Homerism. That was my I question. I would like more <laughs> details about the philosophy of it, because we're getting, you know, did Sam not do this, did Sam not do this? Like, I get the sense that he was a very religious man. No. No, okay. Actually, he wasn't wrong. very religious oh, man. No. The details, they're up. Right. Cool. <laughs> yeah. But he also said, I, I once read, I, I don't know about him and about the history of the family as much as my sister <coughs> does, but I, read, I once read a letter written by Zamenhof in which he says that he would not have uh, created, he would probably not have created Esperanto if he weren't a Jew. And that's, yes. if I w understand well, maybe I'm not, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but I, understood that he felt um, um, rejected uh, because of his Jewishness and that, that it was part of his desire to make the world one and for everybody. Yeah, because he realized he wasn't the only minority in the world. Mm -hmm. and, but being belonging to a <coughs> minority made him oppressed. understand mm -hmm. the feeling. So uh, the homaranism of the, the idea of one citizen of the world would take care of it, that everybody would be on equal footage. <coughs> and uh, in his times, he was actually uh, very criticized. He was, he was criticized for uh, some people were saying that he was doing it to promote actually the fact that he was Jewish and trying to better himself, that it wasn't really the uh, honest um, uh, thing on his part, which was completely untrue. Uh, so the, the idea was of, um, yes, the, the of, of many just to become sort of one. Um, um, so, uh, so Romaranismo, you've just heard nothing about it, that it's just completely, completely new. So, so the idea would be of, um, actually I have 12 principles if you want to. Yes, I, I would love that. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, so I will read it. So, so that will, no. <laughs> <laughs> judge a man by his race, but by his deeds. A country belongs not to one race, but to all its inhabitants. Do not impose your racial language or creed upon other men. Put the name man above nationality. Let patriotism be simply service to regional community of human brothers never hatred toward other men. Let language be a means, not an end. Use a neutral language with men of different race. Let your religion be not an hereditary matter, but really your own. Let your relations with men of different creeds 
be governed by principles of common humanity and helpfulness, cultivate with all mankind sentiments which will unite and not separate. So that's basically every one of those is by itself could make us become closer. I think that Elena was holding Ale her hand. Alex. Oh, uh, also Elena, though. Yeah, I, I had the same question here. Yeah, I have the same level of ignorance about Homer and Ismael. I had a feeling we kind of passed that part of the conversation, but at that time I was going to say I came to Esperanto from the interest of the language and not from a uh, interest in Ismael. Although I was a very idealistic person, I didn't want to have anything to do with political and religious things. And it was difficult for me to to have that part, even though it was the, the best option that could possibly be of anything political or religious, it was still too much for me at that okay. time. And the language still kept me, held me, and the community still kept me and held me and the friendships until um, you're exposed to the language and the community for long enough to come to an understanding and it just it's not it's not so much of a, a language a toy to play with anymore to me. <laughs> Although that did keep my interest for a long time. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Yeah. Um, like uh, Chuck said, uh, and and like Elena said, um, I came to the language because of. Uh, my interest in linguistics and my interest in constructed languages specifically. Um, I tried other constructed languages and then Esperanto later. But my interest was always linguistic until my politics and my philosophy changed. And then Esperanto became a thing I wanted to know more about. Um, on a on a deeper level, and I think Chuck is right that many people look at it as an interesting language to learn. But if you are going to stay in it long enough to be in a room like this, you probably have some part of that philosophy in your your being. After that, you want to meet people and talk to people. Um, and I don't believe that anything is necessarily apolitical because I believe that politics is just an outgrowth of who you empathize with and who you see as fully human. And once you've talked to someone in kind of a mutual understanding, I think it is more difficult to see them as other or bad or evil. So that's when I found Homer Lismo. He was saying most of what I already believed, but some of the principles, as you just read, when I found the linguistic principles as well of like meet on a mutual language and meet on a, that was the part of my philosophy that had been missing. So when I read the language and the history and found his writings on Homer and Nismo, I thought that was the part that I had been neglecting. The, the linguistic aspect, uh, ironically, even though I was a linguist. <laughs> so. Thank you so much. Can I say something? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, since I've started learning Esperanto, I use Facebook much more than before because I'm looking for new friends and, and, and the space to exchange with people from the, the whole world. And I also uh, became half part of not only Esperanto groups, but also I found Polyglots group. And I told myself, this will be very interesting, and some of you uh, are on the Facebook of Polyglots, I think, because many Esperantists go there. You, you go there, I think. 
But I'm not here to criticize anybody, just to say that sometimes I was shocked because people of the poly in the polyglots community were exchanging about how many languages they know, and wh why they are learning them, and what was the next learn <coughs> next language they were going to learn, and why. But it was nothing about communication. Yes, it's fun. May I just defend them a little bit, because I was in this last polygon gathering just a month ago. And what I found out is they were Esperantists. Maybe one person out of three were Esperantists, and, and also the others were kind of Esperantists in their soul. The last talk we ever had there was, uh, was from a polyglot who spoke maybe 20 languages. And he told us that the reason why he did it was not because of languages, that was because learning language A, he could get into direct communication with everybody who was speaking that language A, exactly. and B, and C, and D. Our shortcut to Esperanto is we don't need to learn all those languages. <laughs> <laughs> we just Esperanto for the same yes. effect. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But I was not talking about Bratislava uh, gathering. I was just talking about the Facebook polyglot group in which some people don't think about it. And when I sometimes, yes, go learn Esperanto, sometimes they are laughing at me. <laughs> yes? OK, I won't say anything more. But <laughs> I've got one American popular culture reference and then a historical reference. So in Easy Rider, Jack Nicholson's <laughs> by the fire, and he goes, I don't know what you represent for them is great. Historical reference is simply that if you take the trajectory from ancient Greek democracy through the Magna Carta, through the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the United Nations Charter, what you're talking about is individual freedom. Mm. throughout history and <coughs> people's individual rights being respected. So if you think about that, it seems to me that your great grandfather <coughs> your great your grandfather, grandfather mm -hmm. right um, was way ahead of the curve in understanding that. And oh, so yes. you read those twelve Principles. Principles, and it, it seemed to me that if you were a very astute, you know, political advanced person, that that should be part of the platform of the Democratic Party <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in the United States, right? I mean, I mean, if you're really talking about that trajectory, right? Yeah. It, right? I mean, that's really what's not about. You're gay, you're straight, you know, you're, you're male, you're female, whatever. None of those things matter. It's, it's about what your humanity is all about. And then the ability to speak to other people. It doesn't matter if you're born on the African continent or, you know, Eurasia or the United States. So, um, okay, that's it. No, and as you just, you just oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. summarized it, I mean, just exactly the essence. Yeah. It's exactly the essence. And uh, the only thing I would add to it is that um, it comes with certain responsibility. If you want to call yourself Omarano, then a lot is expected. <laughs> so you have to behave. behave. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anna? Yes. Because of the language. And I must admit, I was very intrigued about what I heard about the language. But really, what attracted me was the culture the culture of peace and goodwill among people. And the way to do that is to think about peace around the world, but the way that we each need to do that is one on one, Absolutely. talking about the person in front of us who we respect as a person and equal to us and someone that deserves the right to be respected. Spoken like true honor. <laughs> <laughs> and what else 
where is the judgment? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I absolutely believe in this principle, but I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are, or anyone in the room who is more educated on the issue, of why you believe it's so important that this is conducted for a neutral language and not for English. I don't know. Well, why, why uh, she said that she thinks that the, the command is not very interesting, mm -hmm. but why should it be uh, based on Esperanto <laughs> language? Well, just because the language, uh, the, the one language will uh, prevent us the, the lost in translation. That's probably the best ex thing that I can say. Uh, and right now, <laughs> probably, you know, young people are used to the uh, what, uh, computer that will translate things for you, for example. But it's still not perfect. You know, one word, for example, can be translated unprecisely and can cause trouble. You know, um, so still this idea of, of one language that we are on the same page when we talk about important <coughs> things. I think so. so I was going to say that, but I think it's one of the great reasons of having just such a neutral language um, is if you don't like someone, you don't want to know anything about them, <laughs> generally speaking. So, for example, if the next language of diplomacy became Chinese. Some people, such as myself, would be like, oh, that's a super interesting language. Let's learn it. But other people might be like, oh, um, for example, maybe somebody from Hong Kong, which is currently going through some political upheaval, might just be like, you know what? No, they have been the oppressors. I will not learn their language. I will not speak it. So then that becomes a barrier where they can no longer communicate. But then when it's a neutral language, even if you don't like them, that wall's already gone to yeah, and from my own experience, I never wanted to learn, for example, German. German had such a weight for me. My parents going through the war and the, the history of Second World War, that it would be the last language for me to be chosen when I was choosing the second language to learn. Uh, and, a lot, and it's still very valid. People go to horrible things, and it's very uh, connected, usually, with the language. Somebody harmed you, there was an oppression, there was you know, the war, whatever, it just stays with you with the language. So if, if you can have the language that is completely void of any baggage, so it's much easier to communicate. I think, I think one of the great, uh, one of the advantages of Esperanto, I think, for me, to this point, is that when you have something like English with a lot of native speakers, it automatically puts those people from that culture on a pedestal. Yeah. North Esperanto, they're, they're not. It's not like that. It's everyone's second language, for the most part. Or it's, you know, it's, it's neutral in that regard, so there's no culture that is you know, lifted up above the others. But I was interested to hear some other perspectives, or other answers, because that's one that I absolutely have heard. And it's a very valid. Mary and Chuck. As a teacher of English to speakers of other languages, English is an incredibly difficult language to learn. Esperanto, on the other hand, I mean, I've learned Spanish, I've learned German. Esperanto is miles easier, and it could be a second language. English never will be, it's too difficult. And I have a little thing I'm going to read. Think about how these words are spelled, okay? <laughs> All spelled with O-U-G-H. <laughs> English can be weird. It can be understood through tough, thorough, thought, though. <laughs> Every one of those words ends in O-U-G-H and is pronounced differently, and that's just a minor thing on part of why English is so difficult to learn. I love Esperanto. I love that I can talk to people anywhere in the world in a neutral language and we can communicate. And English will never do it. And additionally to what you just said, 
a lot of people in the world, not everywhere, but in, in, in America, in Europe, everybody, most of people are learning <coughs> English. And most of people say that uh, they are English speakers, but their level of the language is often not very high. They use it to work, they know technical uh, vocabulary, but they are not able to express uh, feelings, emotions, talk about other things, or not talk them, not express themselves on a sufficiently intense, high, uh, a deep level. And when you want to uh, achieve this level, this uh, knowledge of English, it's quite difficult. It's, it's very difficult, I would say. While in Esperanto, um, <laughs> uh, quickly enough, uh, um, quickly enough, we can uh, attain very <laughs> uh, a level in which we can really express ourselves and ourselves, and also we can construct our world. If I don't know a world, she tells me, well, make it. <laughs> And you can really, I, I feel that I can, I, I'm starting to be able to talk about almost anything. While after three years of English, I certainly couldn't. Now I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we need to be very aware at the time. We're getting close to eight and it's been a long day for everything. So maybe one or two last questions. And then, then before we're done, I'd like Anna to explain to us how you learned the history of your family philosophy. As, as somebody who doesn't speak the language, how did you become knowledgeable about it? So maybe a couple of questions, and then maybe you can address that just briefly. Quickly, I would answer the question. Theoretically, English could be used, or French, or any language, but all but any national language comes with baggage. Which, so with Esperanto, it's easier because the communication on a full basis, where if I speak English and you speak French and we're speaking English, I always have an advantage. And if we're speaking French, you always have an advantage. So it's, it's a, it helps the level of the play. Okay. So well, can, can you ask? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well the, the, the reason uh, probably you know, the, the famous ancestor is, um, it's a lot of responsibility. And <laughs> I've always felt very guilty for um, not pursuing the language. But it didn't mean that I wasn't extremely proud of my great grandfather. So um, um, I was trying to uh, find the literature about him and, and read about him and um, and uh, the Homaranismo really um, uh, really uh, saw think it, 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 the idea was I, I, I thought that he thought it first and then came with the language to promote it uh, he was very Unusual, unique individual. Extremely, you would, if you would to describe him with one word, he was a good person. Deeply, deeply good person. Somebody who decided to be a uh, physician. It's part of, uh, I think his, his character was to, to give help, but, but also he was really. Uh, Good, good, good to the core, and the, the things that were happening around were just affecting him very, very deeply. And uh, he, you know, when he died, he died broken man because he died in the middle of the war, First World War, which just proved his idea not function, not function. So, yes. Who was your Zamenhof grandparent? Excuse me? Who was your Zamenhof grandparent? Grandparent was Anna. 